Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the park. <laughs> oh, let's open a prayer. Lord, thank you so much for this beautiful morning that we can gather together in your name. Thank you that it's nice and uh, cool down here. Well, it's been really hot. It's great to be able to just come out here, be in the open, and in your creation, Lord, and worship you. Lord, we just lift you up this morning, not ourselves. We want to lift you up. We want to praise you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. I just pray over this service this morning, Lord, that we would truly glorify you. Praise things in Jesus' name. Amen. Welcome to the park. 
Okay, just want to say welcome again. Welcome to Church in the Park. We're so glad to have you guys here. We're Resonate Jesus Church, and we just love to reach out to the community and be a part of the community. So we're excited to have many visitors with us today. I have a few announcements. First of all, um, we do have a list in the back of our weekly services. Um, one quick change is tonight we won't be having youth group just with Church in the Park and all the setup and teardown. We're going to take youth group off, but recovery is still happening over at the Place of Grace right next to the theater at 7 p.m. tonight. And the rest of the weekly schedule you'll also find in the bulletin or up by the offering box in the back. Uh, we want to say a huge thank you to all those who helped us with Columbia City Days. Let's give a round of applause for all the volunteers. It was a great day. We had a great time, and it was wonderful. So thank you all. I know some people donated materials. Some people donated their time. Some people came for setup and teardown. And, you know, many hands make light work, and there were lots of hands working that day. So thank you to everyone who came out and helped with that. Uh, we have our men's retreat coming up last weekend in September. Yeah, last week in September. It's $75 um, per person, and they're going to have camping, cooking, fellowship. It's going to be great. Um, Pastor Daniel or one of the elders, you can see them if you'd like to sign up. They have a sign-up sheet, um, and we'd love to see as many men that can join them head out that way. He's going to talk about power tools and boats and oh, 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 all the Tim Taylor stuff. Oh, oh, oh. Yeah. Yeah. And, oh, we have one new announcement. So we've got an awesome opportunity called Evangelism Explosion Training. It's going to be at the Place of Grace on September 9th. It's $15, and um, it's going to be a seminar that includes the materials, lunch, and a practical portion. And basically, if you want to share your faith but feel like you don't know how or want a refresher on how to share your faith with others, um, this is your chance. So do you know what time it's at, Daniel? Is it all day? 8.30 a.m. It'll go all day. That $15 will cover your lunch for the day, and you'll just get some hands-on practical experience. Pastor Daniel will be there teaching through it as well. It's just a great chance to like really learn how we can share with our friends, our family, um, people in the community. It's a great opportunity we want to let you know about. And our last announcement is we always like to say we never want people to feel pressured as far as offering goes, um, but we do offer a, we have a box up there for offering if you'd like to. Um, we also have a digital QR code um, if you want to do it digitally, but we always just like to let people know it's up there. We believe that is something between you and God personally. We believe it is a form of a way we worship God is with our tithes and offerings. So we're just going to um, bow our heads real quick and pray over the offering right now. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this gorgeous day. We thank you for the ability to be out here in um, your wonderful creation and worshiping you and serving you, Lord. And we just pray that you would take um, whatever you've put on each person's heart to give, you would just multiply that, Lord, and you would be using it for your good, Lord. We are your hands and feet, and we just want to serve you in any way we can, Lord. And we just thank you for today. Just pray, pray you would um, bless the rest of our day and our potluck and our baptism, Lord. And we just thank you for all your goodness. In your name, amen. We're going to continue to worship now. <clears throat>
Oh 
get it shy on me, lift up your song. Cause you've got a lion inside of those lungs. Get up and praise the Lord. Come on. Oh, come on, my soul. Don't you get shy on me, lift up your song. Jesus, we thank you so much for this beautiful day you've given us here in the park. Uh, God, we want to uh, thank you for the weather, and we want to thank you for what you've done here in our midst. We want to thank you so much for all that you are, and together we want to pause and worship you in your glory. Lord, we want to stop in the midst of busy schedules and challenges that, that we face every single day, Lord God, with with so many things coming at us, we want to stop and we want to receive from you today what you want for us. God, we're so grateful for your hand in the small things and in the big things. Jesus, we're so grateful for your presence in our lives. We want to ask Jesus that you would continue to heal those broken places in our life. Those wells of sadness, Lord God, that are just so hard for us to deal with, Lord. We pray, Lord, that you would meet us with the, the joy of your salvation. We pray, Lord God, that your, your hand of mercy and grace would be upon us. I pray that you would shine your light and your love into us. I pray right now, Holy Spirit, that you would fill us. Just as surely as we fill our lungs with oxygen, Lord, be, be filling every part of our life and mind and heart right now. Lord, we thank you so much that then miracles still happen in your name, in the name of Jesus. And God, we want more of you and of your will in our lives. God, we thank you so much for your hand and for your grace. In your name we pray. Amen. Welcome to church, guys. It's such a beautiful day. I wish I could say I arranged this weather for you, but uh, the Lord uh, had, uh, had his plan all along. So if you want to open up your Bibles, we are going to be in 2 Corinthians. So if you're in the New Testament, we're going to be in 2 Corinthians. We're going to be reading in chapter 7 and chapter 8. We're going to read 2 Corinthians chapter 7. I'm going to be reading from verse 1 all the way through uh, till verse 10. Since we have these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from every defilement of the body and spirit, making holiness perfect in the fear of God. Make room in your hearts for us, as we have wronged no one, we have corrupted no one, we have taken advantage of no one. We do not say this to condemn you, for I said before that you are in our hearts together. Oh, hold on one second. <laughs> we're not in chapter 7 at all. I'm looking down, I'm like, wait a second. <laughs> this is not the passage we're going to be teaching through today. I looked down, I was like, wait, this is a great scripture, but this is not today. So re rewind the tape. Re rewind the tape back. All right, so 
We're actually in chapter six. <laughs> We're ending in chapter seven. You can't begin at the end. All right, chapter six. So, Second Corinthians chapter six, six verse one. Here we go. As we work together with him, we urge you not to accept the grace of God in vain. For he says, at an acceptable time, I have listened to you. And on the day of salvation, I have helped you. See now the acceptable time. See, now is the day of salvation. We are putting, putting no obstacle in anyone's way so that no fault may be found with our ministry. But as servants of God, we have commended ourselves in every way through great endurance, in afflictions, in hardships, calamities, beatings, imprisonments, riots, labors, sleepless nights, hunger, by purity, knowledge, patience, kindness, holiness of spirit, genuine love, truthful speech, the power of God, with weapons of righteousness for the right hand and for the left, in honor and dishonor, in ill repute, we are treated as impostors, yet we are true, as unknown, yet we are well known, as dying and see, we are alive, as punished and yet not killed, as sorrowful, yet always rejoicing, as poor, yet making many rich, as having nothing, yet possessing everything. This is God's word. As I was looking at this passage with uh, uh, my boys a couple of mornings ago, uh, the Lord just leapt out of the page and just grabbed the hold of my heart and said, this right here is the message. And you might think uh, it's an interesting place to, to begin, right in the middle of a book, right in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, not chapter 7, to say we don't want to put an obstacle in anyone's way there's, so that there's no fault found in our ministry. And as I was thinking about that, I was wondering about, is there anything in my life that is an obstacle to people seeing Jesus? And I want you to let yourself off the hook too quickly and say, no, 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 there's definitely not. But there, oftentimes we will, we will stumble into something or we'll build up a pattern or we'll, or we'll excuse ourselves in one way or another to say, oh, this thing's not so bad. Lots of people do this thing. What, what could the harm possibly be? Paul's saying, don't allow anything as an obstacle for the ministry. Don't put anything in anyone's way, but that they may see God. Do our lives point people to Jesus? Chapter 6 starts off with quoting Isaiah chapter 49 saying, This is the day of salvation. And you've probably heard me in a lot of my messages use that small part of that verse to say, Today is the day of salvation. There is no other. We don't have tomorrow yet. And yesterday is already gone. Yesterday is not the day of salvation because it's already passed. Today is the day to say yes to him with all of your heart and all of your soul and all of your mind and say, just as Nate did last week, not just for Jesus to be my savior, but savior and Lord of all of my life. And then Paul goes on for, uh, if you're an English teacher and you're looking at the text, you can go ahead and look at the text right here in chapter six. The world's longest run-on sentence. Try and read this sentence with one breath. He <gasps> says, But as servants of God, we have commended ourselves in every way, in great endurance, afflictions, hardships, calamities, and beatings, imprisonments, and riots, and labors, and sleepless nights, and hunger, and purity, in knowledge, and patience, and kindness, and holiness of spirit, genuine love, <gasps> truthful speech, and the power of God, with weapons of righteousness, right hand, and the left, in honor and dishonor, and ill repute, and good repute. That's one sentence, ladies and gentlemen. I thought I could do it with one breath. I should have practiced that, actually. I probably should have practiced. So, yes, uh, in Greek, it, work, it flows together beautifully. In English, it is one hang of a run-on sentence. But what is Paul trying to say to us? Paul is, he's listing, there's 21 things he's listing here in this one run-on sentence. 21 things he wants us to hear loud and clear. And he says, these things commend us in the faith. And then my youngest son put up his hand and said, Dad. I said, what, what? He says, what does it mean to commend? And I thought, oh, well, that is kind of a funny word. Uh, to recommend out loud, to show something for what it is, to commend. And I said, thanks for asking that, Luke. Good, good job on you. So, and then we had to look back at the passage and say, how can affliction and hardship, how can calamity, beatings, imprisonments, riots, labor, sleepless nights, and hunger, how can any of those things commend the faith? Because those are the things that we try very hard to avoid. I'm not sure about you, but especially on the road, I'm trying to avoid calamity, not cause it. Wait, you, I, 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 I got one person to nod. Nope, the rest of you all are causing calamity on the roads? Come on. 
We spend most of our life trying to avoid these things, and Paul is saying these things commend our faith. Some of you are going through a great affliction, through great hardship and great sadness. Hopefully, none of you are going through an imprisonment, and if you are, you're probably listening to this message later. Riots, sleepless nights, hunger, these things prove the genuineness of our faith. It's not that if we believe we won't have these things, we will absolutely have these things in our life. These are not the ingredients for a, a easy life. These are the ingredients for a faith-filled, God-centered life. Paul went through more than a few afflictions in his time. Paul went through more than one beating. He was hungry many, many times in his life. Calamity seemed to follow Paul like, uh, like his favorite shirt. And I know that some of you are going through some of the hardest things in your life right now. Maybe not all of you, but some of you, I know. Going through such deep grief and wondering, where is God in the midst of my grief? And the answer is, he is right there with you. He has not abandoned you. These things are not a, a sign of your lack of faith. These things point you back to him. When something hurts, we respond to it. If, if, I'm, if I'm walking without shoes on, which because I grew up in South Africa, I do all the time, and I step on a thorn, wham, some of the thorns here in St. Helens, man, it causes you to pause and to deal with what's going on, right? When you step on a thorn, instantly you know you need to address something right now. These things strengthen our faith if you have put your faith in Jesus. If you have said yes to him, if you have, have made him your Lord and Savior and have made him, you have accepted his free gift of salvation that he purchased on the cross for you. If you've said yes to him, then these things will not drive you from him. These things will drive you deeper into him. And I love that Paul doesn't stop the list there. I'm glad that he doesn't just stop at hunger. If you're looking at, at the afflictions and the hardship and the calamity and the riots and the labors and all of that, he says, and in, in purity, purity of thought and mind and heart, in knowledge, growing in our understanding, in patience, in learning to be the patient people of faith, in kindness. I think our world is screaming for kindness these days. There is such a lack of kindness in our world. You say the wrong thing on Facebook, you're canceled. <clears throat> you make the wrong tweet or you, you like the wrong post and oh, you anathema will cut him off from everyone he could ever love. Get him fired. He liked the wrong post. No, but that's the world we live. We live in a, in a world where there is a lack of kindness. And Paul is saying in purity, knowledge, patience, kindness, these things are what make us different from the world a holiness of spirit, that our spirit is set aside for him in genuine love, not fake love. There's plenty of fake love going around. In truthful speech, and I love that he pairs those two so closely together, in truthful speech, speaking the truth and in love, in the power of God. God has got things that he wants to do in your life, in my life today, right now. He has a plan and a purpose in, in the difficulty and through the difficulty. When things are going well or when things are falling completely apart, he has a plan and a purpose. He says, with weapons of righteousness for the right hand and the left. I like that picture. Not, not single-handed weaponness. If, if you're thinking you're playing a game, you're like, no, 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 no. I want a weapon in both hands. Not a shield. No, weapons of right and the left. Paul says, weapons of righteousness. That our hands would be so filled with righteousness that there would be no room for unrighteousness. In honor and dishonor, in ill repute and good repute, these things commend our faith if we have faith, if we have said yes to Jesus. And later today, we're going to uh, open up an opportunity to say yes to Jesus. And I didn't plan it this way, but we actually have someone who is going to be baptized today. And that is, yeah, a round of applause. So we're going to take uh, uh, 13 uh, tubs of ice. We're going to pour in the ice so that like when we, when we hold, it's, uh, it's Merrick in case you're wondering. So when we hold Merrick under the water that, that he knows he's coming out of it, <laughs> a different man. And as I was, I was thinking and praying through this scripture and looking at these very difficult things and knowing that there's so many of us that are going through 
the time of our lives that is the most challenging and difficult and most heart-rending time in, in your life. We ask for the Holy Spirit to heal and to move and to deepen us in the midst of all of these things that he gets the glory, that he gets the glory from this. Not us, not me, not our church, not our names, but that he would receive all of the glory and honor. I love this run-on sentence because it gives us a full gospel of what life looks like in the kingdom. Life is not always going to go the way that you want it to go in the kingdom. I hate to be the bearer of bad news and to break it to you. Things are not always going to go the way you want. And yet, if they go the way God wants, we will win. As I was praying over these biblical examples, the Lord took me to two righteous men, and one of them you may be familiar with, and one of them you may not be familiar with. And I thought, let's, let's talk about two righteous men and how the Lord commended their faith, how he showed the genuineness of their faith. The first one is Job, and most of you have heard of Job. You can go ahead and nod a little bit. You know who Job was. Some of you maybe know Job. Some of you maybe not familiar with Job's story. Job was a righteous man. He did everything that the law required. So this is before the cross. So this is the Old Testament. Uh, Job is maybe one of the very first uh, in the timeline that uses the covenant name of God, which is so special and precious. He was such a righteous man that he would perform sacrifices in case his children had sinned. Now, I don't have to, I don't have to wonder in case my children have sinned. I know my children have sinned. Because <laughs> if you've been around my kids for more than five minutes, you know the trouble that they can get into. Uh, you were once a kid too. You know how it is. But Job went the extra mile. The law doesn't prescribe that you sacrifice for someone else. That's not how the law prescribes it. But Job, in case that his kids had sinned at the party last night, that very next morning, he would sacrifice on their behalf. Job was righteous and loved the Lord. And he was wealthy. So if you think it's impossible to be righteous and wealthy, Job disproves that theory. Job was a righteous man, and he was wealthy. And the Lord allowed Satan to take everything that he owned, everything that he held dear, everything was gone. In a moment, it was all gone. All of his camels, all of his kids, all of his flocks, all of his herds, just about every last, there was a servant from each of these calamities that came to him and then they were gone. The only thing that God did not take from him was his wife and his wife's wise opinion and her, uh, in her hurt and in her sorrow and looking at all of the calamity that had happened, his wife's advice to Job was curse God and die. That was, that was the best that she could come up with and thankfully he did not. What did Job do when he lost everything, his reputation, his money, his home, his family? He got down on his hands and knees and he worshiped the Lord God. Job was a righteous man in the midst of calamity and pressure. And then Satan goes back to God and says, look, you took everything he has, but you didn't touch his physical skin, skin for skin. If you let me touch his skin, if you really hurt him, physically hurt him, he will definitely deny you. And so the Lord said, you'll see, go ahead. Uh, you can't take his life but you can do anything you want to him. And he was covered from the top of his head down to the soles of his feet in the most painful boils you can imagine. Those of you who are not familiar with boils, they're awful. Think, think pimples that pus and bleed that are this big, boils. That was what Job dealt with. And did Job curse God in any of this? No, he did not. Job was righteous in all of this. Job is an example to say, Job did everything right and everything still went wrong. And he loved the Lord God. And his friends got together to try and comfort him and did a terrible job. Job is the exact perfect picture for us today to say, going through calamity and coming out on the other end as a righteous man, even when he was accused of unrighteousness that he had not done. The other man that I wanted to cover, and this one is a little bit more obscure. Some of you may have heard of him. Go ahead, uh, we'll, we'll do a poll. How many of you know the prophet Hosea. Put up your hand if you know Hosea. You know his story. A couple of you. Yes. All right. So um, we're going we're to start prefacing this by saying God did not prescribe this formula for each of us. Every once in a while, God will do something unique in someone's life and call someone to something specific. Israel as a whole had been so unfaithful to God that God went to Hosea and said, I want you to find and marry an unfaithful woman. And Hosea was like, I must have gotten that wrong. What, what was that God? Sorry, wait, is this my God? An unfaithful? Yes. God said, I want you to find like the most unfaithful woman you can come across and marry that woman. And Hosea was like, okay, Lord, okay, all right. So he marries Gomer and 
she was a prostitute, <clears throat> because we have kids in the audience, we're not going to go into all of what that meant, but he had kids with, with Gomer, and as with, with all people that struggle with sex addiction, Gomer goes back out to prostitution. So he married her, he had kids with her, he, he's doing all of the right things, and Gomer leaves him. Now at this point, you would think that God would say, that's exactly it, here's the picture, Israel's unfaithful and write him off. What does God say to Hosea? God says, go and win her back. Go and buy her back. She's worth it. And I think that's one of the messages that I think we need to hear right now. Even in the midst of our sin and our worst moments where we have failed and we know we failed and we feel awful and terrible, Gomer left a righteous husband and a secure living with Hosea and she went back to prostitution. And God said, go win her back. Go buy her back. I don't care what it costs. Go get her. And for us, that is what God is saying to each one of us. You're worth it. I love you. And even when you fail, even when in your heart you know you failed and it hurts so badly, I love you so much, I'm going to pay to win you back. That is the picture of Hosea. Now, young men, this is not a prescription for how you should find your wife one day. That's not what God is saying to all young men. <laughs> God only said this one time for this illustration purpose and only this illustration purpose. But to say, God loves you with a never giving up passionate love. He wants a relationship with you even though he knows that you have failed him and that you will fail him. Knowing all of your failings, he still looks down at you on your level and says, I love you and I want you now and forevermore. The story of Hosea and the story of Job. Both of them were righteous men. Both of them did what God asked. And both of them had a really hard run of it. And God was in it and God won through it. And I don't know all of what you're going through in your personal circumstances. And, and what God is, is pulling on your heartstrings. But there's this beautiful moment if you want to uh, open to Hosea chapter 10. It's hard to find. It's, he's one of the minor prophets because it's a small little book. Hosea chapter 10, 12 through 13. And it's a... An instruction, I've got it written down so I don't mess it up, that uh, is so important for me. God says this, he says, Sow yourselves righteousness and righteousness and reap steadfast love. Break up your fallow ground, for it is the time to seek the Lord, that he may come and rain righteousness upon you. Now, I'm so glad that my family's livelihood and their ability to eat doesn't depend upon my farming ability. Like... I'm so glad that I don't live in an agrarian time when my kids will only eat if I'm good at, at, at breaking up the fallow ground and, and, and sowing. I enjoy gardening, uh, just like a couple of you do, but to say I am no gardener for sure. God is using a picture in their time that is perfect for that time to say, sow for yourselves righteousness. Those acts of righteousness that he has called you to do, that he... Uh, has planned for you to do, sow those things into your life that you may reap steadfast love. And the second part, for some of you that think, well, I've known the Lord for a long time and I've walked with him and I'm not walking in sin and I'm not in rebellion, so this message isn't really for me. This, this part right here, listen so very carefully to this second part of the instruction. Break up your fallow ground. The ground in your heart, in your life, that has become hard. If you've tried to do any farming or any gardening here in St. Helens, you know the ground is hard. <laughs> after, after the winter, this last winter, I looked down at where I should have grass in the backyard and I was like, oh my gosh, I've got like, I've got like three inches of clay. Like it's so hard ground. God is saying, break up that hard ground. Those places in your life and heart that have become hard, where you have, have not let the spirit work, break up that fallow ground it is time to seek the Lord that he may rain righteousness upon you. Even for those of us that are committed believers and walking with the Lord and not walking in sin, there comes those places in our life where our, our walk has become so rigid and so hard that God wants to break up our routine and draw us into deep fellowship with him. Because he wants us to reap the righteousness that he earned on our behalf. We could never earn it. He earned it on our behalf and he wants it for us. And he paid for it. Paid for it in full. 
We don't add anything to the bill. Uh, we don't add anything to paying for the bill. We add plenty to the bill. The list of wrongdoings, we added plenty to that. But he paid for all of it. We don't get to pay for any of it. We get to walk in gratitude every single day with him. And if we are planting with what he has called us to plant, if we are sowing righteousness, then we'll be reaping the steadfast love that he wants for each one of us. And sometimes that means getting out of our comfort zone. For some of you, that challenge might be taking the evangelism explosion course and learning how to share your faith so that not just for, for you and your own family, but for those people that are in your orbit that are, are dying of unrighteousness, that they can hear who he is and walk in righteousness with you. God has got a plan and a purpose in each of these things. He wants us to look at these biblical examples and say, whether my life is looking exactly like I wanted it or whether my life is completely off of the rails of what I thought my life would be like, I need to be walking in his plan in my life. I need to be accepting what he wants for me and walking in that faithfully. And some of that means walking with the Holy Spirit and listening carefully to what he wants. I think some of the biggest mistakes in my life have been when I assumed I knew what God wanted and I followed that rather than listening for what God actually wanted and following him. Eric is here. We're going to take a a few moments and if you've not had that moment between you and the Lord where you have said yes to him as, as Lord of your life and as Savior, if you've not said yes to him, just as we started with, today is the day of salvation. And it doesn't take, there's no fancy formula for how you can say yes to him. It's a prayer of faith. And so I want, uh, we're all going to bow our heads and close our eyes. And if this is you, I want you to pray this with me today to not let this day go by without saying yes to him. All you have to pray is something like this. Lord Jesus, I recognize that I'm a sinner. Lord, I thank you for what you did on the cross for me. God, I thank you for paying for all of my sins. Lord, I love you so much and I want to walk in your ways. Help me when I fail and when I do good. Help me to love you to the very end. In Jesus' name. Amen. And if you happen to have prayed that, we're going to call the worship band up because we have a couple more worship songs today. And... Uh, do not disappear today because we have several really neat things. So right after service, we're going to be uh, baptizing uh, Merrick in ice cold water today. Uh, no, they actually put a heater in it. They actually heat, heated it up to get it not. Yeah, I know. Isn't that so cool? And then we also have a, ba- a, a potluck right after the baptism. So um, after the baptism, we're going to start setting up the potluck and everyone's going to stay here and just fellowship for a little bit. For a little bit of time, we're going to be fellowshipping together and getting to know each other and there's someone that you don't know, don't mob them, but uh, uh, shake, shake some hands and get to know some people. And then after we pray down here, then we'll be dismissed at the potluck. So the team has asked for just a couple minutes uh, and I'll get the, the heavenly nod when, when everything is set up, then we'll pray and we'll fellowship together with food, which is one of my, I had some right here. One of my favorite ways to fellowship is food fellowship. So we're starting a food fellowship and uh, yeah, I'm going to be king of the food fellowship. So uh, I'm gonna turn it over to our worship team.
an amazing ministry today Pastor Dan brought to us, huh? Where we all walk often. <laughs> God, and he loves each and every one of us. I'm so thankful.
if you're able to, I'd like you to stand on your feet. Uh, we're going to close this part of the service with, uh, with a blessing that I'd like you to receive. And when you're receiving something, typically you reach out a hand, right? If I'm, if I'm taking something, I'll, uh, I'll reach out a hand for something. So reach out a hand and receive from the Lord today. I pray the Lord bless you and keep you, that he make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you, that he lift up his countenance upon you, and that he give you his peace. Be blessed today in the beloved. Amen? Amen. All right. We're going to take one minute break. If you need to run up to the bathroom, go ahead and do that really quickly. And then I'd like to ask you all to come a little bit closer uh, as we shift gears into baptism mode. So one minute break and then come, come in close for, for baptism. You turn it up. I remember one time when I was a little kid, he was talking about cutting out the I was like, <laughs> all right, church family, uh, go ahead and gather up close. Bring the kids, too. Everyone, come on close. Just don't stand right in front of the camera. Camera's right there. So camera's right there. So come closer, 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 closer. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And one right there. So. AB, you're not. Huh? We're not. Are you videoing? Take a minute, and we're going to pray again, and then I'm going to turn it over to... You may not realize this, some of you probably do, but that Matt is one of our elders, and he's going to get to do the explanation and part of the baptism. So, uh, and then if God puts it on your heart, and if you have said yes to Jesus and you've not been baptized, we're going to open it up for you to be baptized too. So let's pray. As, as the family of God, bow your heads, close your eyes. Lord, we thank you so much uh, for your hand in our lives. And God, we thank you so much for Merrick. And this being his last Sunday with us for a while, Lord God, we just are so grateful for him and for the testimony of faith that his life is, Lord God. Lord, we pray that you will just open up heaven and that you will rain blessings and righteousness upon Merrick in this next season in his life. We thank you so much for all that you are, Lord and King, and for all that you do. We thank you. Oh, hello everybody. Hi, glad to see you. Um, so I just wanted to take a second and explain a little bit about what we're doing here. Um, so this is water baptism, and the first thing I think of is water, right? So the water doesn't have any special magical powers. There's nothing like significant about this particular water. We just pumped it out of the river. No. <laughs> so it's nice and clean. It's got, yeah, it's good for you. But um, the, the water baptism is, baptism is symbolic. There's just, just rich with symbolism. And uh, it was, um, sorry, this is pretty cool. I get to baptize my son. <laughs> um, so it's, you'd think, oh, if it's just symbolic, why get baptized? Uh, we believe it resonates that baptism does not save you. Baptism alone. So it's a personal relationship with Jesus that, is what's going to get you into heaven. And so you think, why Why do I get baptized? What's the reason? What's the purpose behind it? And it's there's several reasons. One is that it's a command. It's a commandment from Jesus. He said, go into all nations and baptize them. Just make them disciples. So that's one of the reasons. It's a command. And also, it's an outward expression of your inward faith. So, it's, so when you get baptized, it's you telling everybody that I've made this decision to follow Jesus. And so that's the purpose behind it. Um, I totally forgot everything I was going to say. <laughs> Merrick, do you have something you want to say? 
I, well, he basically said a lot of stuff, so I can't say that now. But I feel like I'm truly blessed to have a Resonate family and also really amazing parents that have raised me well, and I'm truly blessed to have them. And in this new part of my life, I'm not going to always have them there to support me, but I want to show that I'm not just a Christian because my parents are. This is a choice that I'm making and that I want to continue throughout college. So I'm saying this, I'm doing a baptism to say that I'm going to continue being a Christian. So, Merrick, I've got some questions for you. So, do you believe that Jesus is the one and only Son of God, that he came to earth, lived as a man, and died on the cross for your sins? I do. So, you've accepted Jesus as your personal Savior. Have you decided that you're going to follow him for the rest of your life? Okay, great. Okay. Let's go ahead and have a good in. Confession of your faith, I now baptize you in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Dead to the old life, raised to new life in Christ. We have the water all ready to go. Is there anyone that has not been baptized who believes in Jesus and wants to take this step of faith today? Then let's close with a... Oh, no? Someone coming from the back? No? Let's take a moment and let's, let's pray for those uh, in our life uh, that need to both see this and, and feel a touch of the Lord. So grab a, grab a hand of the one next to you. There's a family time. Grab, grab hands really quickly. We're going to uh, pray for both our lives and for the lives of those people around us. And so, uh, Lord Jesus, we thank you so much uh, for Merrick and your faithfulness that lives in him and that we are those witnesses that see what you're doing in his life. And together we proclaim the riches of the kingdom of heaven. Merrick, that you will use your giftings for the kingdom all the days of your life. We pray, Jesus, that you will just continue to use him as your minister, both here and at every last moment that you give him, Lord God. We thank you, Lord God, for our church, but we pray, Lord God, that, that those people that are around us that are hurting and desperate and in need of touch from you, Lord God, that you would use us to love them and to reach them and to show them who you are, Jesus. We thank you so much for all that you are, God, and all that you do. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's give the Lord a round of applause. So, so this is not the time to do a mic drop, right? This is not the mic drop moment. Okay. We're going to come back here and pray for, uh, so do not go up for, for potluck just yet. The, the team's going to get that ready. And so we'll pray from this spot right here. So fellowship together and get to know each other and uh, hugs. I, I think America especially needs hugs today.